immigration in Zimbabwe precedes the Southern African country's independence in 1980, instigated by a multiplicity of factors which include war, tribal conflict and search for better economic and living standards. Such is the story of one Zimbabwean, Ifias Mugwagwa, a young man born in Buhera and finally settled in South Africa and did some sterling work. Ifias Mugwagwa is uh, just a village boy. He was born in Buhera there, in Nerutanga, in a village called uh, Gwatizo. And he grew up in Buhera. He attained his education in Buhera and at, at an upper top school called Nerutanga. He went to Makumbi High for his A-levels. Just simple as it is. The biggest and most impactful wave of migration was in the early 2000s, with an estimated 4 million Zimbabweans leaving in search for better prospects in either developed countries or developing countries with a higher development index than Zimbabwe. I finished my, 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 my diploma in 1999 and then my mechanical engineering degree in 2001. Yes, that's when I finished and when I finished I worked slightly in Arare at some company called PS McComish. But it was a moment when the economy was actually starting to, 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 to be not so good for engineers as per se. I mean, bankers and people who did commerce were doing very well because it was the period of hyperinflationary environment and people who work in the banks were doing very well. And, um, and that's when I migrated to South Africa. Since then, Zimbabwe experienced an unprecedented brain drain across all sectors, including medicine, infrastructure development, finance, etc. There was an opportunity at Eskom then, which is the power services provider or the power supplier, and, uh, and I had got an opportunity as, a, as an engineer there. As Zimbabweans have settled in their destination countries, their indelible hallmark of resilience, hard work, high literacy and excellent work ethic has strongly resonated with local labor markets, resulting in most of them being catapulted to key decision-making platforms and others running personal successful businesses. To establish something of my own, I needed to be a professional engineer. And to be a professional engineer, you can be recognized when you practice in South Africa. So I went to that guy. He, his name was called Aubrey McKenzie. He was having a company called Mzanzi Consulting Engineers. And I said, Aubrey, I want, to work, I want to work with you. And when I want to work with you, I want to have this experience of the consulting environment and I want to become a professional engineer. Because in this environment, I'm more like a contract administrator. And now this guy called Aubrey McKenzie said to me, if I want to work, yeah, you come and work. And by then I was like, earning almost 25K. It was a lot of money then. Then when I went now, I went to work with this org, I showed him my pay slip. And by the end of the month, uh, as I started working with him, he gave me 7,000. So I downgraded from 25,000 to 7,000. And he said to me, I said, but this is not enough, friend. I've got a big card. And this old Ricard Jolly said to me, you said you want to learn. I'm giving you an opportunity to learn. While there are varied migration statuses in these assumed destination countries, such as refugees and asylum seekers, the majority were skilled and educated economic migrants who made remarkable contributions to local economies. I went downgrading from 25,000 to about 7,000 for the whole year. And after that whole year, I was registered with EXA, which you call Engineering Council of South Africa, as a professional engineer. In, in 2006, MC was established. We, we became so big in 2007. Well, because the space which we ventured in, we became among the first black people to establish uh, the engineering, consulting engineering firms. Because predominantly, it was, uh, it was, it was white. But what South Africa did now is, but their BEE, which they call Black Economic Empowerment, it's, it's different from other countries in Africa where they only target the politically connected individuals. South Africa, their BEE is practical to the effect of impacting the men on the ground. So we took advantage of that BEE and it really promoted us.
I remember by the time when we closed in 2007, we that was in 2007, the amount that we banked for the company, or which was in the account of the company, it was then 500,000 rands. That's 2007. Which was a lot of money then. And then in 2008, there was a big jump. By the time when we closed for the end of the year, we had about 5 million rand in the company account in 2008. And um, well, I have learned something that um, uh, when a person at some point in time needs to drive big, let them do that because they are covering the gap of what they haven't done before. And in 2008, we began to be all that excited and also draw big. But anyway, we passed through that stage. Here we are, maturity comes and then it precedes all that. So yeah, that was 2008. We, we have done very big projects and uh, we are also very happy and proud that uh, when a very big project comes out in the country, when they need uh, people of color, whom they call people of color, black people, or black-owned companies who are like us, it's very difficult for us, for it to pass without us being considered. And in 2008, we got a very massive project called Magupane Concourse Redevelopment. It's a, it's a PRASA project, then it was for 200 million rand. But now it is actually a, come up now to around 400 million and then we came in uh, by the end of 2008 we did also the forensic science laboratory which was um, a 70 million grand project and uh, by the beginning of 2009 we got what they call the pharmaceutical devil and uh, we were mechanical engineers with the pharmaceutical devil which was a 400 million grand project in 2011 we got a very big project called the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. I think we all know that that's a flagship project. This is one of its own kind. Although in Africa we used to have about three uh, children's hospitals, one the Cape Town Red Cross Hospital, the second one being the, the one in Egypt, and we used to have two of them. But now what happened is that the NMCH, the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, it was a flagship project in the sense that it merged an academic hospital in Florida, you know, and it was a massive project of about one billion rand. But at the moment, we're actually doing about uh, almost 100 schools in the Eastern Cape, demolition and rebuilding. It's a project of almost 4.5 billion rand. Yeah, demolition and rebuilding, and it's a massive project. But now, let me come to Zimbabwe as a country now. At this particular moment, our economy is very depressed. And you know that the, the consumption, or, or, or what I can say, the buying power of, 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 of the population is very low. And, and, and when the buying power of the population is very low, at that particular moment, people concentrate on two essential things. Number one, which is food and health. So when I came into Zimbabwe, the best thing which I did was actually to provide food. So I have a, I have a big chicken farmer. And um, I'm a big beef farmer, so I'm providing food. We started last year, and when we started last year, we started on the 6th of June with only 18,000. Now we have risen up to about 55,000. And uh, and this batch which is there now, which you, are going to, which you will see at the farm, is about 55,000 chickens. And uh, thank God that you've come now, and we we'll, we'll have some pictures and some videos for them. They are still on the ground, some 10,000 went out to the market last night. But the other 45,000 are still there. So, yeah, and, and our aim is by the end of the year, we want to reach a target of 100,000 for, for the chickens. When we started this project, it was only two, six very small runs. But now what we did is that when Taurai and Trust uh, made a suggestion that our runs are too small, it was only one, two, three, and then we combined in the middle, and then we started extending, going with them there. So we ran with them up to the almost 100, 100 meters going there. My advice to business entrepreneurs is that um, if you want to do business, and you look at short-term goals and short-term achievements, we're not going to develop the country 
because we're looking at ourselves as an end point. But if we're looking at our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren as an end point, what it essentially means is that uh, we'll do business which is sustainable because we are not the end point of that business. What I have seen with Zimbabwe at some point in time is that we, we need to unlock our barriers to what I can call we, we have got barriers to, 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 to investment injection. Let me tell you a typical example. Do you know that to form a company in Zimbabwe, we know to form a company, it will take you a very long time, up to, two to 21 days or so. But if you go to other countries like Rwanda, you will be having a company within four or five hours. And uh, which is so different from Zim. And I want to tell you something which also happens, which is very painful about the way we do, we think of investment as a country. At this particular moment, Bay Bridge is actually our economic gateway of the country when it comes to revenue collection. You send a truck to come all the way from South Africa to come into Zim. I'm a chicken farmer with chicken equipment. The truck arrives at Bay Bridge today. And when it arrives at Bay Bridge today, you are told that uh, the system is down. The system is down for how many days? For three days. Tomorrow the system only works for an hour. The system is down, you can't do it. And then now you begin now to think, to say that if I let this truck being there for a further one week because the system of these people are down, what it means is that uh, the equipment which is actually in, the, in that 30 ton truck, the parking fees and the leasing fees and whatever, whatever, will outweigh the equipment which is there. So you instruct the driver to come back with the equipment. And then you begin to put the equipment uh, on small portions of about 100, 100, 100, 100, or 20, 20 on the bus. And you don't pay duty on the bus. Now, what it means is that the country is losing revenue, which is duty, which is supposed to be paid by the person who is bringing it because of our thinking pattern, which needs to be changed in actual effect. And then I'm saying, this person in Bay Bridge needs to pay duty. But why can't you make it very easy for him, for you, for him to pay the money? He's not borrowing money. He wants to give you money. So when the person wants to give you money, make it very easy for him to leave as much money as he can because that money goes to the states. So, so it's our thing. Do you know, let me tell you this, do you know that if you come as a tourist, you come into South Africa, you're driving to Zimbabwe, if you arrive at Bay Bridge Border Post, at South African Border Post, it will take you just about five, 10 minutes to die. But if you arrive at Bay Bridge Border Post, you're more like a prisoner who is getting into the country. The process is on their own. It will take you two, three hours just to do a simple process. You pay, get pass, you pay the TIP, you go to the police, you go to the compliance, four, five hours. But this person needs to pay TIP and he needs to pay, to pay for the get pass to get into the country. But you're making it difficult for you. Such that next time again, he doesn't come driving. And who is losing is the country which is losing. So what I'm just telling you is that we as Zimbabwe, as much as we are open for business, but we need, we need to change our way of thinking when it comes to investment.